I begin, uh, I'd like to um, tell you a little bit about this story. I'll start by introducing the captain. The captain um, is single-minded and ambitious in the extreme. Uh, more than anyone I've ever met, he has um, an ability to attract and motivate the energies of people. I believe that someone with this kind of power must be motivated by something incredibly strong. Um, in his case, I believe it's a desire for retribution. Retribution for something that was stolen from him, torn from him in a way that he felt was terribly unjust. Here he is. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is what he really looks like. It's not a great picture. He doesn't show up well on film, unfortunately. <laughs> but his name is Captain Dan Moreland. And he does have an ivory leg, but it's metaphorical. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I believe his ivory leg is this ship, the Ernestina. The Ernestina was built in 1893, so it was over 100 years old, and was built not far from here in Essex, Massachusetts. She was built to fish the Grand Banks and did for a long uh, and productive career, which she followed by uh, a stint of Arctic exploration, going north of the Arctic Circle, and as if that wasn't enough, she was uh, actively employed in commercial sale, bringing immigrants to the United States right up until the year 1965. Incredible. After that, uh, the ship went into decline. And um, the captain, Captain Moreland, with uh, a small grant from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, did an award-winning restoration on the vessel uh, for which he was uh, given a commendation by Governor Dukakis, and um, which he lovingly sailed and for about 10 years. In the uh, early 90s, a uh, state audit uh, revealed that some funds were unaccounted for. It was determined that they were uh, used irresponsibly, and he was laid off, as was the board of directors. <coughs> He lost his ship and uh, had a great uh, damage to his reputation. So, the ivory leg. The white whale was the Picton Castle. The idea was to take an existing hull, a hull um, in sound condition that was built at the cusp of the age of, age of sail in the age of steam, when ships were designed to be powered by very low-powered steam engines, like the Picton Castle's steam engine, only generated 92 horsepower. They used the hard-won lessons of sailing ship design to make sleek hulls that could move easily through the water. The plan was to add a cosmetic bow, a cosmetic clipper bow, add three masts, some yards, some sails, some rigging, and pff, presto instant tall ship. The ship would be financed by private investors, their conversion, and then the voyagers would pay for themselves with a fair paying crew, people who would pay for the privilege of working aboard this ship. Uh, for this voyage around the world, and for, for all voyages around the world, uh, the, the price is about uh, the cost of one year at a private university in the United States. Uh, the Picton Castle, when the captain bought her, was a freighter. And you can see the captain in the foreground with the ship behind him in Bermuda as he is attempting to bring her across the Atlantic, stopping for a while, trying to raise money so that he can bunker fuel and bring her the rest of the way to Lunenburg, uh, where the refit will be done. You can see on her name board, she's called the Domar. She went through about 11 different names in her long uh, career. She doesn't look much like a sailing ship there, does she? You can see even the bow goes straight up and down, a plumb bow. 
uh, the ship had a number of different jobs in her 70 year career at that time and uh, one of those jobs was uh, a term of service during the Second World War in the Royal Navy. The Picton Castle was originally built as a North Sea trawler and because she was a trawler she had gear that enabled her to be easily converted into a minesweeper. They carried sweeps behind her with serrated blades they would cut the moorings of the mines, and when the mines bobbed to the surface, they would be uh, detonated with a deck-mounted machine gun to protect the ship from explosions on the bow. She had this A-frame device, which you can see extending from the bow. That's called an acoustic hammer, and it would slam the water, hopefully detonate the, um, the mine before the ship uh, could collide with her. And they don't always work, as the crew of the Picted Castle could tell you from that time. The ship actually had a mine go off under her bow, which caused an explosion that I'm told lifted the ship bodily out of the water. And when they were stepping the masts in Lunenburg, they found that there wasn't a true center line on the ship. There's an actual twist in the hull that it's believed uh, happened during that explosion. None of the crew were harmed during that uh, incident. Now, when Captain Moreland was um, uh, trying to sell this idea of the Picton Castle, he um, had a business plan and this drawing, this great idea. Um, he also had himself to sell. Um, as I mentioned, there was this uh, tarnished aspect to his career, but for the most part it was very impressive. One thing, one thing that impressed people, that gave him the confidence that if anyone could do it, he could, was four years that he spent as bosun of this ship, the Royal Danish school ship, Denmark. As ev everyone in the tall ship industry knows, that Denmark is about the best of the best in terms of seamanship. Captain Moreland was the only North American ever to be an officer aboard this vessel. And for four years, he took a hand in the training of every young prospective merchant marine officer to come out of that seafaring nation. He was also in charge of just about every aspect of that ship's maintenance, except for, say, the engine room and the galley. Another thing that impressed people about his career was two years that he served aboard this ship, the Brigantine Romance. The Brigantine Romance in 1977, when Captain Moran was just 22, made a voyage around the world with a cost-sharing crew for 18 months. This was the voyage that he modeled the first voyage of the Picton Castle on. Did I mention that he was just 22 at this time? He served under a great captain, and a great sailor, and a person that the modern day tall ship movement owes a lot to. He's special because his career reaches all the way back into the age of sail. His name is Captain Arthur Kimberly. He has um, hands that are so big from work and so leathery that they look like antique baseball gloves. One side of his face was stove in by an out of control winch handle and he lost one of his eyes. He's covered from the neck down and the wrists up with tattoos, exotic tattoos, dragons and, and roses and ship names. And here he is hand stitching the bolt rope of the Picton Castle's to Gallant while the Picton Castle takes shape out the window on the right tied to her dock in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Now Captain Kimberly probably didn't dream up the idea of tall ship cost shared adventures around the world. He probably, but before I go into that, let me just show you the ship that Arthur Kimberly sailed in, the Abraham Rydberg. It's a Swedish four-master. 
and he made a voyage around Cape Horn and a voyage around the world in that ship. Now, Captain Kimberly got the idea from cost-sharing adventures around the world from this famous skipper, Captain Irving Johnson. Irving Johnson made seven successful and safe voyages around the world in his famous Yankee ships. This picture is scanned from the pages of National Geographic. And here's his ship, Brigantine Yankee, from National Geographic as well. In 1923, he served aboard this ship, the four-masted bark Peking, and he shot a wonderful documentary of his experience on that ship <coughs> called Sailing Around Cape Horn in Peking. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. This ship is permanently berthed at South Street Seaport in New York. Now, Captain Irving Johnson probably didn't dream up the idea of cost-shared adventures on rare rig sailing ships. He probably got the idea from this guy, Captain Gustav Eriksson. Uh, Gustav Eriksson is a Finnish um, sailing ship owner who is distinguished by the fact that he managed to keep a commercial fleet of cargo carrying sailing ships turning a profit right up until the Second World War. He did this by being a ruthless cost cutter. <laughs> he would buy ships at scrap value and then run them until there was no more life left in them. But soon, even that wasn't enough. He had to find a way to cut costs still farther. He had to get people to pay to be crew on his ships. <laughs> and that's what he did. Looks like fun, doesn't it? <laughs> As Irving Johnson said in his wonderful documentary, they rigged netting on the rails of the ship and they called them strainers. They were meant to strain out the sailors. <laughs> Something like that. Anyhow, there was a wonderful book that came out of that era by a young man whose father paid for him to make a voyage on a ship on her last voyage ever, on any ship's last voyage ever of that era. And it's called The Last Brain Race by Eric Newby. And it's a wonderful read, and I highly recommend that too. Newby may have been encouraged to go to sea by another writer, a man who hails from Boston, Richard Henry Dana, Jr., who wrote Two Years Before the Mast. Dana was um, a student at Harvard Law and had come, came down with a case of the measles. Because he was a very studious, bookish young man, read a lot and threatened his, his eyesight with blindness. There was nothing, no medicine at the time that could, that could cure him. He decided that the only thing that could help him was uh, to ship out on a merchant vessel, hoping that the fresh air and the hard work and the simple diet would turn his eyesight around. So he shipped out on this merchant vessel from Boston sailed around Cape Horn to California and back and returned um, inspired to pick up his pen in protest because he was appalled by the, by the conditions of life on these merchant vessels. He was going to write a screed against the merchant marine that was going to blow the lid off the whole seamy underworld. Of course, this book had the complete opposite effect. <laughs> There's probably no book today that's inspired more people to go to sea <laughs> and to keep these ships around long after any reasonable person would. Both books are favorites of Captain Moreland's. And there he is in a current picture in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Now, just as every captain has a chief mate, every Ahab has a Starbuck. Now, this is just a metaphor, of course. 
But as you know, if you've read Moby Dick, Starbuck, one of the best mates from Nantucket, found himself in the awkward position of being the conduit between an obsession and the people who could make it happen. In that situation, you had to have a steady internal compass. This is the chief mate, Brian Donnelly. Looks like he's leading a whaling expedition himself. That's actually a pilot whale tooth that he wears around his neck. And we're in a, a Monomoy surf boat developed just off Cape Cod, actually, um, on some time off on uh, an expedition around the island of Bora Bora, looking for a place to land for the night. And here he is gaffing a fish in the Torres Straits, a yellowfin tuna. That's how I remember him, just a wiry coil of, of energy. Now every uh, sea story has its Ishmael. This is me as I steer the ship out of Lunenburg. You can see I'm rather cold in that picture. It's November 25th. The voyage is already 25 days behind schedule. The ship was really, by most standards, not ready. But it was either go or be locked in Lunenburg for the winter and lose the voyage. Lunenburg, as you can see, is a, a, a town that goes right up the steep banks of Lunenburg Harbor. Everyone has a view of the ocean just about, and all the houses and shops are painted these beautiful colors. Lunenburg was chosen because there were the kind of skilled tradespeople there that have a tradition reaching continuously all the way back to the age of sail who could do this kind of work. There was a foundry that's been continuously active for over uh, probably 200 years, I don't know exactly. There were not one but two blacksmith shops, three sailmakers, a blacksmith, a dory maker. This was the place to do this conversion. It's a town that I'm proud to call the town I grew up in. My mother was a sailmaker in this town. And here she is sewing a spinnaker in one of the oldest sail lofts in Lunenburg. My father was a wooden boat builder. And this is the boat shop that he started in what used to be a pig barn right next to our house in Rose Bay, the next bay over from Lunenburg. That's my father and that's me in the lower right hand corner. <laughs> Dad got me into boats at a very early age. As you can see from that picture. Okay, you haven't changed a bit. No. <laughs> and here I am getting the hang of it. <laughs> when I was just a kid, um, and uh, just a baby actually, and Dad was an apprentice at Stevens and Sons Boatyard uh, near Lunenburg, uh, a man at, who was 55 had sailed in the Brigantine Romance, that ship from earlier under Arthur Kimberley, and was inspired to have a ship of his own, a square rig sailing ship, and take it on voyages. He commissioned the building of this vessel, the Sheila Yates. Um, became friends with my parents. And when he returned to Lunenburg nine years later, in 1984, when I was about nine, he invited me uh, to go on a passage with him to the Magdalen Islands. I did three separate uh, trips with him, and uh, on the third, when I was 11, I caught this wonderful picture of a, an iceberg off the coast of Newfoundland. We went all the way to St. Anthony in the northern tip. Uh, it's very sadly, uh, three years later, the ship sunk off uh, south of Greenland. She got caught in pack ice and the hull was damaged and she was sunk. Uh, all the crew were saved. When I turned uh, 12, Jeff Pope, the captain of the Sheila Yates, decided it was time for me to move on to a bigger ship. And uh, he gave me a recommendation to join 
This ship, the Ernestina. Captain Moreland's ship. In 1987, I sailed for two months aboard this vessel as cabin boy and um, was an actual part of the crew, steering and standing watch and cleaning. And it was a great time in my life. I did that another summer and then decided that it was time for me to learn some more skills and I decided to build a boat with my father's help. I wanted to learn everything I could because I had gotten my direction in life. I wanted to be a tall ship captain like Captain Moreland. And there I am with that caulking mallet again. Here I am taking up a little drinking habit, maybe a little early. <laughs> at the launching, and here I am, taking it on a cruise around the waters near Lunenburg with my dog. Um, the next year, at age 16, uh, with again with a word from Captain Moreland, I was, um, I took a position as a deckhand of this wonderful ship, the Shenandoah, which you may have seen sailing the waters of Buzzards Bay She's beginning her 42nd season this year, and as far as I know, is unique in the world of tall ships because she has no engine. You can imagine it was great training being aboard that ship, setting and taking in sail every day, short tacking up uh, narrow harbors and s entering Nantucket under sail. Then, uh, at 19, I was the skipper of this day sailing yacht out of Lunenburg. And um, at ages 20 and 21, again with a word from Captain Moreland, a recommendation from Captain Moreland, I was very lucky to be um, a petty officer aboard this vessel, the U.S. Brig Niagara, which sails Lake Erie. There we are crossing the lower yard. It was all done by hand, walking around a capstan. Now this experience was um, important to me. This ship is where Captain Moreland ended up um, after he was laid off from the Ernestina. And though by the time I joined the ship, he had already gone to follow his dream of the Picton Castle, everyone on the crew was still talking about him. They were so, so enchanted, so infatuated with the idea of the Picton Castle that you could see their eyes light up when they talked about it. It was, um, it was this part of this attraction to real blue water sailing in a tall ship. Not just sailing on Lake Erie. It was uh, the attraction of sailing in a vessel that represented the height of the evolution of square sail, a ship from the turn of the last century, or like a ship from the turn of the last century. It was a chance to take part in the creation of this dream and then execute it on a maiden voyage around the world. And it was a chance to be a part of Captain Moreland's vision as he's on this uh, mission to make his mark, I believe, in the world of traditional sail. It's very hard to describe. It's, it's kind of like, it was kind of like this. <laughs> I joined the ship on May 1st of 1997. It's May 1st. It's the, it's the reunion, or the, the anniversary. And the ship looks something like this, except that there were no yards, and no top mists. We stepped those top mists and crossed the yards and Wesley remembers when we painted every uh, square inch of that ship and uh, did so much work I can hardly describe but we did hundred hour weeks. We worked like animals to get that ship ready and on October 15th when the fair paying crew arrived the ship was nowhere near completion. <laughs> I mean, there weren't even bunks. 
but everybody pitched in. And eventually, though it took a long time, all the crew came together. And you can see that there's no distinction. So, why did people do this voyage? Why did people come? Some people came out of an interest in the Picton Castle and in Square Rig Sail. And who wouldn't be inspired by a ship like this? People came for adventure. Like in this picture, just out of Lunenburg, where just under Stasels, the ship is rolling and healing 45 degrees each way. Here's another example of the tremendous wind during that time. You can see that coil over on the left-hand side of the screen. That, that water-soaked manila brace blowing out almost horizontally. People came to travel. Arriving in a port by tall ship affords you a almost unique access to the people who live there. And here we are um, furling sail while Kuna Indians nuzzle up to the ship in dugout canoes. This is not far from here. This is just at the western end of the Caribbean Sea. Uh, they still have facial tattoos and nose rings. And uh, they wear beaded uh, bracelets and, and um, decorations going on their calves and these beautiful rec rectilinear patterns. And they sell these beautiful um, applique handcrafts called molas. And you can see on, on that woman's dress on the right, uh, she's wearing a mola. That's what they sell and I'm bartering with these two women. Another example of the kind of access you have, the kind of uh, opportunities you have to be welcomed into people's um, lives is here on Pitcairn Island, an island that has, uh, it has a tie to tall ships that goes back all the way to its founding when the bounty mutineers settled there. And uh, a tie that was again uh, revived by Irving Johnson. And here we are playing Crack the Whip with the wonderful children who live on this island. We came to experience strange new sea life, like, like this um, sea lion blocking our access to the shore in the Galapagos. <laughs> Animals are not afraid of people there. Or this extremely a uh, happy but very dead puffer fish that we found on the beach. <laughs> What's with that puffer fish? Of course, nowhere was the wildlife more rambunctious than the children of Takaroa in the Tuamotu's archipelago. Here we tied up the ship to paint the hull. And there was absolutely nothing we could do to prevent these children from scaling the wet painted hull and smearing white paint all over their hands and feet and tracking it across the deck and up the ladder and across the pole head and over the rigging and, and then from which they do a double axle into the raging current down below. Then get up and, and do it all over again. <laughs> And here's another example of travel. My favorite place, I think, that we visited was in the Solomon Islands, where the people were um, the people were approached us in their dugout canoes, but were less familiar with travelers. And you can see in this picture how they hang back from the ship, kind of checking us out. No one there had any cars or even bicycles, but everyone had one of these beautiful hand-carved dug out canoes. Those two vessels are not the same size, by the way. I know they look it. 
Okay. These canoes were so light that even a child could carry one and get out of the rain. At no point in their hull were they even thicker, it seemed, than about five-eighths of an inch. Everybody had one, but they didn't have much else. <laughs> a wonderful place. And here in Vanuatu, second mate Karen Baylog entertains children with soap bubbles. One of my interests on this voyage was to learn about uh, where, where uh, sail fits in the world of, of, of commerce today. Um, a clue to that question came to me here on this beach in the town of Ahmed in Bali. And you can see sailing vessels, fishing vessels, sailing fishing vessels lined up on the shore, pulled up from their day's fishing, hauled a pontoon all the way down the shore. And if you look at that next beach all the way on the left, another row of these fishing vessels. But nowhere was it more dramatic than in Zanzibar, off the coast of Tanzania in East Africa. That is an Arab dhow, which sails with these beautiful Latin sails. There are over 200 uh, registered dhows on the island of Zanzibar. And just like they have for millennia, they carry cargo between Arabia and Africa using the monsoon winds that alternate direction twice a year. This was another favorite place, the island of Aldabra and the Seychelles. Here you can see a tortoise in the foreground. It was almost impossible not to get a photo with a tortoise in the foreground in this island. <laughs> there were 100,000 times more tortoises than there were people. <laughs> and here's the ship on our way home, almost there, uh, rounding just off Cape Town with the uh, magnificent Table Rock in the distance. People came for camaraderie. As you can see in this picture, we were playing a game of folks or poker. Actually, I lie, that game wasn't that fun. <laughs> These two guys on the right got in a fight afterwards. See, we'd already been to Bermuda, Canada, Aruba, uh, the Galapagos, and I don't know where else by that time, but if you've ever tried to play poker with five currencies, <laughs> <laughs> You'll know what I mean. <laughs> People came for, for brotherhood and for sisterhood, as you can see here. The second engineer, Claire Yannicone, plays cello with her shipmate, Rebecca Scher. Came for adventure and extremely fresh new foods. <laughs> You can see this photo was taken just minutes later. <laughs> people came to learn. As you can see, these people are learning to shoot a noonday sight, noontime sight, on the quarter deck. Or as the crews gathered around to hear a weekly lecture from Captain Moreland. This one happens to be on the evolution of square sail. People like me, and a lot of the people in the Picton Castle came to learn the art of square rig seamanship, especially where it applied up in the rigging. Here's an example. This was on a passage between the Galapagos Islands and Pitcairn Island, where we're about a week away. and about a week away from any kind of reasonable medical attention. <laughs> and we're crossing the royal yard, the highest yard on the ship, 
under full sail in a rolling sea. And the whole idea of metal repair, that didn't even enter into the equation. This was standard operating procedure. We were expected to be able to do this. And the opportunity to do this was one of the real attractions of the Picton Castle and uh, was something that a lot of us were really burning to do. Here's a woman sewing canvas. And a couple of riggers serving wire rope to protect it from the elements and from chafe. People came to test their metal. If you can see, the engineer is testing his, uh, welding the steering gear, which, after a series of Force 10 storms in the North Atlantic, had failed, had very nearly failed, had cracked, and was threatened at failing us just when we needed it most. You can see the concentration on the helmsman's face as he tries to as he tries to nurse along this, this limping ship. And you can see that the seas, that's, that's relative calm compared to what the ship was going to encounter just hours after the engineer had fused that steel back together. But a lot of the time, it was very frustrating. And life aboard the ship was gritty and uncomfortable. A lot of the time, as these people will tell you, as they do their laundry with a, with a hard bristled deck brush and salt water and dish soap, and then hang it to dry in the rigging, where they'll take it down hours later, smelly and kind of salt encrusted and not very much cleaner than when they started. <laughs> And there are a lot of long days of, of hard work in the hot sun, carrying 50-pound bags to all inconvenient areas on the ship. And there are days that were dreary and repetitive. And there are times when it was just very homesick. In short, we all came for a bit of this. But a lot of the time, it was maybe more like this. <laughs> and the next photo, I think, um, exemplifies that. And you can see the similarities. That's from a period when, when the voyage was in great peril. Not from a storm, but from maybe a lack of will or desire or joy or but it almost ended I'm going to do a reading I'm going to read you from the first chapter and this next slide is meant to give you a bit of atmosphere Chapter 1, Gale Warning, November 25th, 1997. As evening deepened, swells grew high. Driven across the North Atlantic, they rolled under us and smashed into white against the snowy bluffs that cradled Lunenburg Bay. The Picton Castle had felt so large and steady there. Now, as we plowed into the wide ocean, pitching, rolling, testing the concrete ballast that we'd poured. She felt small. I tightened my grip on her wheel for balance and thought of our 30 green, fair-paying crew. Most, unaccustomed to rough nights underway, grew seasick and cold on deck and below. We pressed farther from land, and the strengthening wind piled the swells steeper. It kicked up whitecaps, tore them into spray. The air was below freezing. I pulled my hat down over my ears, lifted my wool collar against the cold wind that blew over the stern. The ship, 
179 feet overall, rock so that our iron freeing ports, meant to shed water from the deck, opened and slammed shut with a string of clanging reports. In a still harbor, the deck sat just three and a half feet above surface. In a rolling sea, water sprayed aboard on the low side and surged across the deck in torrents. She was wetter than I thought she'd be. Above the engine's deep chug, a near gale force wind whistled in our new rigging. It had been a while since a square rigger had sailed out of Lunenburg Harbor. From the 1860s to the 1880s, Lunenburg was home to an impressive fleet of 25 to 30 square riggers that carried cargoes all over the globe. By 1912, the last of them had her yards removed so she could be handled with fewer crew and scrape by for a few more years in an industry doomed to fade away. In late November 1997, I looked up to our topsails, lashed to their yards just days prior. Two on the fore, two on the main. I was impressed that the captain had set the uppers in this wind. Twenty-five days behind schedule, he hungered to make distance south before the storms of winter could lock us in, before they could rob his last chance to hold the confidence of the fair-paying crew who'd helped finance his voyage. Chief Mate Brian held the rail for balance as he walked aft from the chart house to the end of the quarterdeck where I steered. Under the shade of his sou'wester, I could see his brown, close-set eyes. He fixed them on mine, like he always did when delivering an order. Come right to south. Come right to south, I repeated, and then leaned into the wheel, feeling relieved to steer away from this cold, away from the disappointments of my Ludenberg summer. Crew tugged on the braces to pivot the yards as we changed course. If everything went well, we'd fetch the tropics in a week. Then the order would be steer west, and it would stay west until we circled the globe. Dressed in a long black raincoat and knee-high rubber boots, Captain Dan Moreland stepped from chart house to quarter deck and mustered his watch. I felt my toes clench in my boots and made an effort to relax. The man looked tired from our four-month sprint to ready the ship. The gray patch on the chin of his beard had grown, and his face seemed long. He spoke a couple of clipped sentences and disappeared back into his chart house, leaving the management of his watch to Jesse, his lead able-bodied seaman. Jesse, with a few days scruff on his cleft chin and a ponytail pressed down by his wool hat, sent one of his professional watchmates to relieve me at the helm. I walked towards the chart house to report that I'd been relieved and noticed that many of Jesse's crew were women. Some of them looked uncomfortable, likely wondering why they'd each spent $32,500 to be here. If you fall overboard, Jesse said to his watch, jam your marlin spike in your eye because there's no way you'll be rescued. His watch laughed nervously at the severity. I chuckled too. I was not quite so serious as Jesse. Probably it was reflected in my rank. A second string, able-bodied seaman, below the bosun on our watch. Still, Jesse was right. A man overboard stood next to no chance in this water. I worked my way forward to the forecastle for a few hours rest before my next watch. I climbed into my upper bunk, drew the curtain, flipped on my 15-watt reading light, and settled my shoulders against the bulkhead. At about 30 inches, this forecastle bunk was wider than most in commercial ships, and I was one of the lucky few with a porthole. No doubt it would be a luxury in the tropics, though now condensation and ocean spray obscured its glass, sparkling emerald in the starboard sidelight. I grabbed my journal from the shelf beside me. Pulling up my knees to prop the book, I slammed them noisily into the guitar I had strapped to my overhead. I muffled the strings, and with hands stiff from cold, I wrote. It has been many months since I've written an entry. I've been working like a dog on the ship and finishing my sea chest. With few thoughts I put on paper, I have sent to Ariel. These months have been poignant. I've gotten to know Dad much better. He's a sage man and carries a lot of sadness. His eyes were filled with tears when we sailed off the dock. Laurel cried on my shoulder last night. 
I didn't expect it. My sister and I have been so aloof lately. I love Laurel. She seems both grown up and a little girl. Mom cried today. The last few months have held a lot of disappointment. I avoid the captain. My father is worried about the voyage. I feel I've grown a lot here. Everyone has. Here I go. Homework bound. When watch duty came around at 20 hundred hours, Chief Mate Brian ordered me back to the wheel. The sky was near black except for a spattering of stars visible through a rip in the clouds. The seas had grown more turbulent, and cold wind grabbed at my throat. A brass hood with a glass window like an old-fashioned diving helmet had been placed over the binnacle. Inside it, a red light illuminated the compass card that swiveled and kicked. I held the wheel and tried to get a sense of the conditions. The sea was on the quarter, not quite from the stern. It pushed us around, corkscrewing the ship through the water. Yaw, roll, and pitch. After a while, Bose and Josh, our stocky, bearded watch leader, told me to help a new crewman learn to steer. Patricia Lynch, a Boston lobbyist, was one of the few crew not seasick. She stood beside the wheel and leaned towards the compass, squinting over pharmacy reading glasses that were obscured by salt spray. Her hands clutched the spokes of the helm tightly, partly to steer, partly for balance. In the light of the compass, I noticed she wore mascara and lipstick. I smelled expensive perfume on the cold northwest wind. A touch left, I said. Just a few spokes. Now bring the wheel back amidships. That's good. I can't see a freaking thing, she said in her smoky voice and laughed a full raspy laugh. I liked her spirit. Try steering for those three stars over there. Those ones in a row. Orion's belt. Patricia steered for Orion while the wind built to the predicted gale force. The temperature continued to drop. Icy wind tore the tips of waves into long streaks of foam that glowed pale white in our stern light. The ship stood up well to the growing swells, and her high square sails helped dampen her motion. Though when the seas caught her right, she rolled through 80 degrees, swinging her tall masts like chopstick. Standing near bow or stern, you could sometimes feel her drop from beneath us. She put her nose down. A burst of speed, she headed for the trough. She nearly stopped, blasting salt water over the bow. When we were deep in these troughs, the tops of the swells covered the horizon, even looking from the quarterdeck with eyes 16 feet above water. Are you okay, Patricia? Oh, I'm fine. She tilted her head back and laughed, her lipstick deep red in the dim light of the compass. I just feel like I'm in a movie. Patricia's spirit reinforced my idea that laughter and activity ward off seasickness. I learned to act as if the ailment didn't exist. Acknowledge that not in your gut or the sting of a headache and seasickness will overpower you. At 2200 hours, Bose and Josh had the helm relieved. In one of his typically descriptive orders, he told me to take a watchmate on a ship check. Buddy up, he said. Look in all the compartments. Look for water. Make sure no one's hurt. Tend the coal fire in the galley stove. Make sure there's no fire anywhere else. Look in the hold to see if the cargo is secure. But don't go in if you don't have to. We threw a little coal in the stove's firebox. Kettles fenced in on the stove top rattled. They held coffee that our eccentric cook had sewn into mesh bags and left to boil for God knows how long. That coffee making technique and her delegation of all cooking duties in Lunenburg were some of her less welcome efficiencies. We walked forward to the forecastle, into the quarters of my fellow ABs or able bodied seamen. We heard the scrape of sea chests moving in their lashings and the slap of wet foul weather gear against bunks and bulkheads. The compartment pitched, yawed, rolled, dropped, stopped. The main salon, Though it moved less, was a disaster. The sickly sweet smell of supper was still there, but it had been altered by the acrid smell of stomach juice, accompanied by the wretch and splatter of barf-hitting buckets. 
A peek in the cargo hold revealed that the goods on the starboard side had settled. On the port side, a haphazard stack of used bicycles reached nearly to the overhead and teetered precariously. We climbed the broad main salon ladder to the deck and waited for a swell that had just piled over the rail to roll to the low side of the ship. Leaning into the wind, holding on to the rail on the ship's high side, we headed quickly to the stern of the main deck, a place we called the Aloha Deck. This was where the seasick people were. They'd come for the abundance of fresh air. In the light shining from the mess, I saw their pallid faces twisted in pain. The seasick sailor leaned over the rail next to the spare lube oil barrels. I knew that horrible feeling, a head full of worms, a diseased animal in the stomach, clawing its way up. We climbed the ladder to the quarterdeck and waited until midnight when the next watch relieved us. It felt about time. The small patch of clear sky had long since been choked in by thick cloud, which drove a cold rain. We gathered by the chart house, where Chief Mate Brian accounted for us, looked everyone in the eyes, and said good night. As I turned to descend the ladder, making sure the greenest hands made it safely to the main salon, Bosun Josh clamped his hand on my shoulder. I turned to look at his face, inscrutable beneath beard and sou'wester. The red chart house light emphasized the bend in his nose, busted three times, once by Marlin Spike. Rigel, he said, sleep with your boots on. I rolled my foul weather pants down over my boots and wedged them between a couple of sea chests below my bunk. I figured the bosun's comment was exaggeration, but if his instinct proved right, I'd be able to jump into them like a fireman. I climbed into my bunk with my clothes on and wedged myself in with dirty laundry, pillow, and blankets to keep from being thrown around. They were all wet from condensation, and the forecastle smelled dank. I felt like a pig in a cement mixer. A confused sleep took me, interrupted by the hourly passing of crew on a ship check, the jarring smack of tall waves against porthole, the racking shudder of the bow sliding sideways down the face of a swell. Heavy rolls made the foul weather gear stand out from its hooks. Heavy rolls left me clutching to stay in my bunk, thinking for a moment of the events that brought me here. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, did you use right and left as opposed to port and starboard? No. No. Just um, only on screen. <laughs> no, the ship was rigidly traditional. And so, um, so stri as strict as, as, as an old schoolhouse marm about uh, um, ship terminology. For example, it would be inappropriate to say back aft. That's as bad as um, splitting an infinitive, because aft means back <laughs> already. Um, uh, and of course, um, you know, uh, the sails were all made of um, canvas, and the, all the uh, running rigging was made of manila, and um, you know, there, there was not a bit of synthetic uh, running rigging on this ship. So, does anyone have another question? Yes. Getting back to uh, Dana, what did you find about your voyage was perhaps most like a sail on the age of Dana, and what's perhaps most different? Well, I can say that with respect to this voyage, what was different was people's expectations. I don't know what Dana's expectations were, but I, I know that uh, he didn't expect it to be, um, to be um, comfortable. Um, uh, a lot of the people who signed on the voyage, particularly in the beginning, did think that. And um, it, was a, um, it was a big source of friction. Um, on this voyage. You know, you can imagine trying to sell this, this, this ship and this voyage on a ship that's not even built yet. 
um, the captain admits to maybe having given people unrealistic expectations, and he he uh, paid for it during this voyage. It was a, a real struggle. One more question, and then wrap it up. Now, I yes. Um, of all those paying customers, were a lot of them unhappy and you know, wanting to leave? The yes. <laughs> yes. The short answer is yes. Um, and um, there were a lot of unhappy, fair-paying crew in the beginning. Um, there were uh, the ship started out with a complement of about forty, and it went down to twenty-seven. Um, of leaving only, um, let me do the math here, leaving only, um, I'm not very good with math on the spot, but that left only 13 of the 30 some people uh, who had originally, who had originally bought berths aboard the Picton Castle. So they bailed out somewhere in the tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to, I don't want to give away too much of the book. But um, it was a it was a str it was a struggle to uh, get the ship back on track, and um, uh, it's a story about a crew coming into their own and uh, realizing and coming to grips with their identity as sailors and as seamen uh, with a responsibility for the ship. And uh, I think that's that's what these uh, that's what everybody learned. And I will also say that there were a lot of people who came with the expectation, with the desire of having a very challenging experience. And these people um, were enormously fulfilled and um, wanted nothing more than, than to be um, working for the good of the ship. And uh, we're in this voyage, uh, come hell or high water, whatever happened. So um, I guess that's, that about wraps it up. And I want to thank you again for coming and, uh, and listening.